welcome to the Scouse Science Podcast. My name is Tom Solomon. I'm here at the University of Liverpool, where I'm Professor of Neurology and Director of the UK's Emerging Infections Research Unit. My guests today are Chief Constable of Merseyside Police, Serena Kennedy, and headhunter and author of Cambridge Code, Curly Maloney, as well as my Scouse Scientist friend, Holly Ellis. Guys, say hello to everyone. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hello. Great. Good to see you all. Thanks very much for joining. And today's program is all about leadership, but we have to do a little bit of housekeeping first. So um, as our regular punters will know, you can chat with us using the chat function on Zoom. Or if you're on Facebook, we usually have thousands on Facebook. You can type away your questions and comments. And to check it's working, we always like to do a little test run. So uh, if you could, I'd like people to say hello, say where they're from, and whether you're a first timer or a repeat offender. And also, uh, we like to have a question. I think today's question is going to be on New Year's resolutions. What's the most ridiculous New Year's resolution you've ever done or ever heard of? And um, we'll get to yours in a second, Serena and Curly and Holly. (laughs) But a bit more of the housekeeping. Uh, We like people to follow us on uh, Facebook and Twitter, of course, and then also to uh, find us wherever you find your podcasts. And whilst you're there, please uh, give us a like or a follow or a review. And you can also catch up on all our previous Scouse Science podcasts, including we had Edwina Curry recently talking about climate change. We had the writers, Rachel Clark and Gavin Francis, Jonathan Friedland from The Guardian, Andy Burnham from Manchester, Dame Louise Elman. We've had all sorts and chatted about all sorts of scientific things. So if you're interested, please have a look back there. Now then, let's introduce today's guests properly. First of all, Serena Kennedy. So Serena, welcome. Thank you. You are uh, you grew up in West Lancashire and you went to school in Ormskirk and um Wigan and then you did you actually did science at university and were interested in doing for becoming a forensic scientist indeed uh, but you found your last year of science boring particularly being in the lab and so you approached the forensic science problem from a different angle and you joined the police uh, and you've worked in uh, Manchester and Cheshire and Merseyside working your way up to be the first female chief constable of Merseyside Police. So congratulations on that. That was about eight or nine months ago, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right, Tom. And along the way, you've done a major incident team, serious crime, and also quite a lot on community policing. So let's start by asking you that difficult question. What about uh, your most ridiculous uh, New Year's resolution you've ever made? I have to say, I'm probably quite boring. I don't think I've ever set a ridiculous one, although I probably set the same one every year about um, losing weight and, and getting fitter. So it's ridiculous in that I set the same one every year. And it never works. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. Or, it or does. maybe I should say, maybe <laughs> very, that's offensive. What I should say, it, why, why do you bother? You don't even need to do that as a New Year's resolution. <laughs> <laughs> Curly, what, what's your New Year's resolution? The most ridiculous one, I think, was to be brave enough to jump into water. I hate getting my face wet, so I thought I resolved to teach myself to either jump in or dive in, but I haven't been able to do it. Sorry. So you still never had your face wet? <laughs> no, I do clean it occasionally, but <laughs> not in jumping in capacity. All right, cold water. And and you, so so Curly, uh, actually, as a scouser. Um, g- give us a bit of Scouse accent. I know you don't sound very Scouse now, but... Uh, oh, OK, I have to... All right, Tom, if I only concentrate, I can do it quite well, you know. Uh, there you are. You see, she is a Scouser. <laughs> but you went to um, uh, a university in Oxford and then Cambridge where you did medicine. And I think we sort of overlapped a little bit, but I don't think we, we, we really came across each other there. And after medicine, well, in fact, during medicine, you were really interested in the conscious and subconscious brain activity. And so after studying medicine, you joined the commercial world and found to, founded this international executive search firm, these headhunters, Maloney Search. You better just give us a sentence on what, what headhunting is for those who are unfamiliar with the term. Oh, so we, um, a company, an organisation or anybody with the wherewithal um, can tell us what they want and we then go and poach them from another organisation. And typically that sort of senior roles, chief executives of companies or 
vice chancellors of universities or even senior policemen. But we'll come back to that uh, in a while. Absolutely. And, that, and then you also wrote this book uh, and, and came up with this program, The Cambridge Code, which is about uh, basically a, a, a simple way into the kinds of things where normally you'd have to spend ages with a psychologist to work out what you're good at and what you're all about. And this is a half hour code and a book that goes with it. And um, it's been very popular, in, in, uh, I understand. Have I got that right or have I not quite advertised it in the right way? You've got it completely. Yeah, we set out to digitise the experience of sitting with an oxyke so that we could um, have a little snapshot of your subconscious mind. Oh, an oxyke is an occupational psychologist. So you were doing lots of that work through your headhunting and then you thought, actually, there must be another way of doing this and you've made it all more widely available through that route okay Absolutely. and holly before we let you go holly can you what do you want to share with us your uh, any new year's resolutions uh, uh, well my one this, different? my one this year was um to go to back to the gym because i've been paying for a gym membership for about a year and i've been like once so i have been once in january up to now so i mean that's i didn't give myself a time limit i just said to go so i think that's all right that's not too bad <laughs> so you've managed once so far yeah once so far that's all i don't i'm a great non-believer in new year's resolutions i, I think they i think the minute you think of one in you know mid-december just do it and 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 just keep doing it and don't try and tie it to the new year because... oh no i can't do that i have to wait till anything if i was going to do anything in december it was getting left till the first of january <laughs> all takes all sorts i guess um so okay let, let's just go back then to this uh, this leadership thing so um i think clearly uh serena you've be, you know you've got this leadership role now and along the way i guess you've risen up the ranks and you have um also appointed people to senior positions what do you what do you think makes a good leader what's important in leadership I think there's been a real change in police leadership. You know, I've been in policing 28 years and I think of some of the leaders when I joined to where, uh, to where they are now. Um, uh, and there's very, um, I, I suppose, there's lots, as with all leadership, there's lots of different styles, but you definitely need to have a good command and control style of leadership in policing because of the, inst the nature of the instance that we're dealing with. So you do need to be able to do that fast time decision making. Uh, but there's also a real need, I think, um, around, and this is something that I'm really uh, driving in Merseyside Police now, around that compassionate style of leadership and the value that you get by investing in your people. And, and you, and, and, and along your career, I mean, you, as well as doing crime and you know serious, serious things like that, you've also put quite a lot of effort into working with communities, etc., haven't you? Which I guess is more on the compassionate side. Yeah, I have to say, you know, uh, dealing with our communities is, is is why the majority of us join policing, whether that be as a police officer or a member of police staff. Um, policing loves its visions and its strap lines and Merseyside is community first. And that for me absolutely uh, resonates why, you know, what I wrote on my application form probably 27 years or 29 years ago when I was still at university about why I wanted to join policing around that ability to support communities, help the most vulnerable uh, in our society. And that, that is just as true today for me. It's what drives me, what get, gets me out of bed. And whilst mm. I'm not in you know, contact with our community every day, I very much see my role about you know, enabling, ensuring our staff um, have got the ability, to, uh, the, the ability, the skills, the capability, the knowledge, uh, and the right behaviours as well to uh, engage in our communities. And I always love the NASA analogy. I talk about it a lot around it doesn't matter what your role is in the organisation. It's absolutely mm. about making sure we put our communities first. The NASA analogy, is that the thing where the, somebody went and asked a fella? Uh, the cleaner. A, the cleaner, what he, did, what he did at NASA. And he said, I put... Put men on place. the moon. Yeah. yeah. And that's, you know, we've talked about that a lot through COVID. Um, you know, it's been a huge mm. one team effort, which is another of our strap lines. But, you know, whether you are a cleaner who, who has been keeping our buildings clean and, you know, sanitised to enable us to be in work, because obviously as an emergency service, we've been, uh, the majority of us have been in, in work throughout. Whether you work in vehicle fleet and it's about making sure we've got enough vehicles on the road so we can get out and respond to, 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 our, uh, to our communities. You know, our IT team in terms of that ability to turn on a sixpence overnight and move from move parts of the organization into uh, agile working 
managing to bag the 500 laptops before the NHS placed an order for 25,000. <laughs> uh, so we could yeah. enable some of our staff who were vulnerable and did need to shield to work from home, but still feel part of the organisation. So it is very much, everything is focused on that. Yeah. How do we put our communities first? In Let me come back, you, you mentioned compassion as being a, a something now in leadership that maybe wasn't there before. What, Curly, what are your thoughts on that? You know, you've, you've worked with, I think, 30% of the top 100 uh, FTSE, isn't it? Uh, you've helped recruit to those positions. Is compassion a, 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 an important part of leadership? Is, is it increasingly recognised or is it not so important in those companies? I think compassion is hugely important. And whether it's called compassion, um, you know, there's something about being a leader. I always talk about the three eyes. Um, you sort of need to, you know, inspire. You sort of need to influence and include others. Um, and some of that sort of inspiration is around compassion, um, you know, people can feel that you, you have an empathy with them. Um, it comes to the other eye, the inclusion. Um, if you're compassionate, you take people on that journey with you um, in that inspirational way. And I think it's hugely important for a leader. And what else do you, what, you know, what would your other top things that you're looking for in, 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 in leadership, wherever the role is? There's something about effective leadership. So um, a little bit to Serena's point, you know, they've got a she's got a tough job to do, and you know, you have to be effective in your leadership, um, but you have to be energising in your leadership as well. So we look for people who somehow can give that gold dust to others um, with an effective outcome, but really sort of being able to impart that energy even as they walk past them. Um, you know, empowering is important for leaders. So the ability to step back and allow people to find their own. You know, sometimes by accident, I've seen, you know, a senior leadership team member leave an organization and everyone starts panicking. And then you see this wondrous moment of other people stepping up into that role because they've been empowered. So that's something else we really look for. Yeah, I think I've seen that at, at, at universities, actually. We've you know, where somebody has been there a long time and had a pivotal role and you people can't imagine life without them. And then actually when they go, uh, others flourish in all sorts of ways um, that, uh, you know, and often things can be much stronger than you have a whole team of people flourishing rather than, rather than just one. Uh, absolutely. There's also something about, I think, sort of conscious leadership. There's often a debate about people say to us, well, do you think they were born a leader or, or you know, can, can we give them sort of leadership traits? Can we train them? Um, and I actually think it's a bit of both. I think, you know, if you're mm -hmm. born an entrepreneur like me, you actually have to really work at your leadership skills because it doesn't come that naturally. But actually for others, their, their sort of innate traits, um, you know, means that actually they can, um, they can, you can develop those skills um, and you can learn from others. So I think it's a bit of both. You've had, Serena, you've had a couple of things that you've, you know, had to lead through in, since you've become chief constable. I, I think there was the, the, the bombing at the women's hospital and then also this uh, tragic case of this young girl, Ava White, who was murdered. Do you, how, how, were you ready for those things in this role or were you kind of taken, a, it's quite a baptism of fire, I would have thought. Yeah, it was. I, I must admit, there's not many chief constables seven months into their uh, into their uh, role end up dealing uh, with incidents like that. Um, in terms of readiness, uh, I suppose I go back to that kind of command and control. So, you know, we do rehearse um, for uh, terrorist incidents and we had had an exercise last year in Merseyside so that our commanders and our staff um, so there was a little bit of kind of muscle memory kicking in um, and we work really closely with our counter-terrorism colleagues, counter-terrorism uh, Northwest. It's a regional team, but they're based in Manchester, but they knew where they were coming to. Um, they'd worked from there on the exercise, though so there was that element of familiarity. We'd met each other. So there's an element of that being really important so that you do plan. Um, you've got contingency plans in place. Um, likewise, doing the same with our partners uh, in terms of um, our resilience forum, our, our Merseyside resilience forum, exercising events like that. Um, but I think what um, 
that's has stood us in really good stead as a region is working together uh, through as a partnership through COVID. Um, you know, it's been we're 20, you mentioned COVID uh, when we were chatting before, we're 21, 22 months into COVID now. And we have had what's called the strategic coordinating group running for that whole period. So that's where the strategic leaders within the city come together. Uh, And I have to say, you normally stand them up. So when we had the fire at the Liverpool Echo Arena car park, you know, we stood an SCG up then and it stands up for a couple of days. You may have heard the phrase used when there's a flood or, you know, or a natural disaster like that. So it's it's, it's something we're all practised in, but, you know, we're able to stand up an SCG and work through the issues together. With COVID, it's been really different because who, you know, we've never faced a pandemic before and we've also never had an SCG running for so long. But I think the bit that I've learned is a crisis is not the time to build relationships. Um, So having had those really strong relationships as strategic leaders across the region and in the city through the work we've done through COVID and, you know, we really have... um, done each other's roles and we've cut through red tape and we've not been bound by service level agreements Mm. uh, with COVID because we really just had to turn everything up um, as you know um, through the work that you've done at the university um, and approach take a different approach with COVID that stood us in really good stead when we had the the, you know the events at the Liverpool Women's but also Ava White in terms of I think it just demonstrated um, really well nationally about that strong sense of, and I always love it, that strong sense of pride uh, in the region, in mm. the city, the connectivity yeah. between the partnership, but also the connectivity with the communities. And the way that manifested itself is what you didn't see following the car explosion was a massive increase in hate crime. So we didn't allow individuals who'd want to capitalize on that position and that situation for hate crime to take over yeah. so i was really really proud of of the work that our communities did have you curly how has the um the pandemic impacted on on your world either in terms of what you've how you've had to operate differently or maybe what you've seen differently in terms of demands from clients and the kind of you know senior people that that, that companies are wanting to appoint it was sort of extraordinary tom Um, in sort of March, literally our phones didn't stop ringing with people cancelling their assignments. It was the knee-jerk reaction of um, firms, governments to say, we're putting a hiring freeze on. I took a deep breath and thought, well, I've been here before in the financial crisis. Don't, don't, don't get rid of everybody. Um, but that's what people wanted to do. People were very shaken. That was their sort of first thing. We can control whether we hire anybody. Um, I think everyone then drew a breath. It was a very difficult couple of months um, for everybody. Um, we spent, and a lot of people spent time talking to each other, um, endless Zoom meetings. Um, and then actually a couple of months later, come the summer, it was so lovely to see companies saying well actually we do have to keep on investing in our talent and in our future and actually the market came back and we had a you know stronger year than the year before and we've seen that across the board actually um but we've seen a you know real impact in the sort of the generation z or whatever it is now um where you know people had to work from home and they have found it really difficult coming back into the office actually um and the support lots of firms are trying to give to encourage people to come back so so we have those water cooler moments so that we thrive off each other you know it's for for people's well-being i have been encouraging them um when it's safe to, to, to be back in so that we all, you know, get that personal interaction that's needed. It's been, it's been the same here. I mean, it's been, uh, I think some people have really struggled with coming back in, even when it's allowed and, and people yeah. are frightened and um, it, you kind of have to remember that, especially if you're not so frightened anymore, uh, that a lot of people perhaps don't really understand that they're protected by their vaccines and that they can ease up a little bit. And people have been very, you know, cut off, uh, even outside of COVID times, you know, if you're away from people for a while and then you're suddenly with them again, it is different, isn't it? It does take a bit of getting used to. I mean, have you, Serena, have you had to coax people uh, unwillingly back to the office or have most of them been in anyway? 
Well, it, it, it obviously, the majority of the police officers have been in. We're an emergency service. We've got to be there to respond and support our communities some of our yeah. police staff enabling functions we have uh, been able to facilitate them um, working from home I think where we've really focused our energy um, is around our new recruits because I think that connectivity to the organization and those water cooler moments that uh, Curly spoke about when you're joining an organization that reach into the organisation, that understanding of the standards and values uh, of an organisation is so important at the start of that, that journey. And obviously, you know, when we talk about policing, we talk about a career and it's normally, um, a, you know, quite a long career, although we, we, we uh, are watching our Generation Z um, and with Curly, I don't know where, where we're up to with our generations, but we are watching uh, in terms of what they think of long careers and whether they move about. But it's really important. And I suppose it links back to the leadership piece around how do you instill those standards and values when you are uh, when you're trying to do uh, online learning. And so we have, wherever possible, tried to make sure that our new recruits are still face to face. So I have to say the workforce, our trainers have done a brilliant job. You know, they've been, we've split shifts. People come in days late to make sure that we can try and enable that face to face teaching. Are you having Curly? Are you having people who, who just because obviously clearly your job, you could do a lot of it without ever being in an office again. Are you are you how would you? What are you doing with those who just really don't want to come in? How are you convincing them? Hmm. Inspiring leadership, I think, Thomas, which uh, I'm okay. resorting to, um, <laughs> and, and a heavy arm. Um, I think with Serena, we were very conscious about our new recruits and our, on, our, on our early people. On the, We love bringing in smart young grads to train them to be headhunters. It's a great way to look at the world. Um, and they needed the next levels up to spend time with them. So... We were trying to give the pride back to those people to say, listen, you know, you're needed. You know, these, this, the next generation of headhunters, um, a collective term for headhunter, I don't know what it is. Anyway, the next generation um, need you. You know, we want to, to get them out there. So, so with a little bit of, um, and a little bit of, um, also, I'm afraid you have to come in on these days. Yeah. So carrot and stick. Carrot and, yes. and stick. Now then, um, Holly is going to join us. She's been keeping an eye on what's been happening out online, what the comments and questions are. Holly. Hi. Um, yes, so there's lots of um, repeat offenders, as you like to call them, Tom, watching yeah. in, especially our favourites, your Auntie Judy and Uncle Peter, who've said hello. Um, we've all got, also got an interesting hello from Sharon Pearson, or previously O'Prey, who was Curly's first biology teacher and form tutor in grammar school. So she's watching you there, Curly. <laughs> I remember her well. And on, what, what was she like? I think if I'm right in saying she had this amazing hair, long, 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 glamorous hair, very glamorous biology teacher, um, and, you know, was good with carrot and stick, that's all I can say, but quite inspiring. <laughs> we'll have Great. to ask, ask Sharon to give us a, let you know what sort of student Curly was. We want the dirt. <laughs> yeah, put it in the chat, Sharon, and we'll, um, I'll, I'll feed it in. <laughs> um, so someone's asked the question about, um, is self-confidence an important factor in becoming a leader? And I guess that links into another question we've had, um, which is about having self-confidence and have either of you ever had imposter syndrome? So I guess that's sort of like the opposite where you feel a bit out of your depth and, you know, oh God, how, how am I doing this role? Go on, who wants to go first on that? Maybe Curly. Um, I think that self-confidence it's such an important, some people, you know, are born with self-confidence and, it, and it's slightly linked to resilience. You know, how resilient are you? If, if you receive a knock, it doesn't matter how far down you fall um, to feeling like a helpless baby or feeling like a, a slightly annoyed toddler or a very grumpy adolescent. It's how quickly you come back to your sort of resting adult self. So that bounce back ability um so that resilience sort of gives a self-confidence as well um so so hugely important in in good leaders we see that trait um 
you know, really, really shining through. Um, and also sort of you have, you know, the flex, the psychological flexibility to be able to flex in a crisis. So not about whether actually you'll move from here to there, but whether actually you have the psychological capacity to handle a change of events and a crisis. Those people have an inner confidence that sees them through. Um, imposter syndrome. Well, let, before you no. get to imposter, let, let's just... <laughs> Um, I mean that's interesting because in your in your book you talk about these the, the the baby stage the toddler stage the adolescence and you you're you sort of frame things in terms of when something upsetting or unexpected happens you know you get knocked off course and you might behave a little bit like that um, and then you it's about how quickly you get back to where you were and you I think in the in the book you you talk about a professor is about to give a big talk at a conference and just as you go up to the podium you trip up and fall. Um, uh, and you know, been there, done that, and and then you sort of talk about the interesting responses and how and 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 Serena, I'm sure you can um, you know empathise with this as well. You're just about to do something and then something goes wrong, and you talk about how some people will just feel terrible, want to stick their thumb in the mouth, cry, and go home and curl up on a sofa. Um, or others, that's the baby, I think, and um, and others might be angry about it, and that's kind of the adolescent sort of room. And, 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 you know, and then others might just make a bit of a laugh of it and a joke of it and, and actually absorb that into their, into their piece. So, um, no, it's, a, it's kind of interesting to hear you re- reflect on those things, which, which fit with, with what you're saying in the book, but it does sound like a degree of self-confidence is, is critical to getting you back on, on track. Um, so really I would agree to, with, I would yeah. agree with Curly is that, um, I think the bit about resilience, so it's, it's, it, it's how you bounce back from them. So, you know, um, do you stew for a couple of hours and then it's water for ducks back and you think, right, crack on? Or, or do you really reflect and it, and it, and it impact on your delivery o- over, over the next few days? And I think you have to spend some time understanding what your triggers are because we probably, depending on the circumstance, depending on the individual, um, we will have different ways in which we, in which we react to use your phrase, you know, whether you do react like a baby or an adolescent or, or, or an adult. And I don't think there's one, you know, we're all, we're all different in different situations aren't? and you have to understand what your triggers are and be aware of them and just kind of almost coach yourself um, back out of that situation, back to normality, which is, you know, absolutely around resilience, isn't it? What are your triggers, Serena? What are, what are the, the things that would make your blood boil or put you off course? I think it's that just, um, I suppose it's probably everybody's got it. It's, it's that, um, you know, that failure when you, when you think, when you think you failed at something and, and, and how you deal, how you deal with that. But, you know, I'm really trying to encourage with the Merseyside police that, that, that try, try something, let's fail fast and, and let's move on. So, uh, you know, having to kind of do that myself, but I think, I think it's a much more it depends again on what platform you're on um in terms of who you who you as you say who you fail fail in front of but i think it is that that feel of failure i think i've mastered a very good um swan uh, swan <laughs> technique because everybody would say that they would never know that i was nervous or something that was impacting on me and yet inside um you know i am yeah. like the swan with the with the legs going under the water because you told us today you were absolutely terrified about coming on this uh, podcast but you look uh, so <laughs> no, she never she didn't at all i'm teasing <laughs> what about the imposter um what imposter syndrome uh, serena maybe your thoughts on that first although you've you've talked about it to some extent anyway but yeah, yeah. no i have to say i've massively suffered with imposter syndrome um in 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 my career um uh, every level um i have definitely expected someone to come and tap me on the shoulder and say well, we've made a big mistake here's your here's your van keys and, and get back to being uh, a constable and uh, it's it was really interesting i did um i did a, a bit of a podcast did a vlog uh with a with a male colleague who's got um who's got imposter syndrome and I laughed. I said, this is almost like going to Alcoholics Anonymous and there being a bottle of vodka in the center of the table because we both had to do, knowing we were being videoed and watched by the organization talking around uh, imposter syndrome. But what was really refreshing was how many people responded to that blog to both of us, to emailed us, and both male and female, because it's often uh, seen as a very um, uh, imposter syndrome that often talked around in relation to female gender 
But, you know, my experience of the response we got back from that podcast was, um, you know, it was our it was just as as true for our male colleagues. Uh, and it lasted with me until I probably got about 24 years service until I passed a national assessment centre. Um, and there's only there was only about a 40 percent pass rate. So up against lots of colleagues nationally. And I thought I must be doing something right if I can pass that. Absolutely. And I think uh, just in case we haven't explained, I think we did, but imposter syndrome, for those not familiar with it, it's the idea that you get in a senior position and you always feel like you're not you shouldn't really be there. You've somehow blagged it through. And any minute somebody's going to rumble you and say uh, you're a load of crap. You really shouldn't be there. Um, Curly, do you see this among among people? You know, do you, do you find you're having to encourage people to apply for positions where they thought, gosh, that's not for me at all? And it turns out. They, they really you know, were suitable? Gosh, sort of, um, yes, we see, um, in fact, the other day I was speaking to a, a female chair of, a, of one of our um, big sort of, you know, financial services companies, um, had been a chief exec, um, and she'd done the Cambridge Code, actually, and I said, goodness, you know, there's, there's an element here in your potential that says, you know, you sometimes have an element of self-doubt and self-worth. And she said, yeah, I'm always thinking, really, what, why am I running this organization? There must be someone better than me. I said, but you're amazing. She goes, I know, but I still think that. So um, to give everyone encouragement, even some of our very senior figures do have this. Um, and soon to your point, we do sometimes see with females, actually, we had to write another line of code when we were writing the algorithm for the Cambridge Code, specifically for, for, for women who were taking part in the trials because we found that they wanted to control the test. They wanted to not show their real selves, not because they weren't wondrous, but because they were worried what people would think about them. So rather than show it, they, they just held themselves a little bit aloof. Um, so we do see that, and we see that often with um, really brilliant women um, who say, but Carly, I, I don't answer every single bit of the job spec. And I'm like, Yes, but you answered ninety-eight percent of it, and you are amazing. Um, and then I'll interview a successful non-female, um, and they might, um, and they'll say, "Yes, yeah, so, you know, I've got a couple of these things, but I'll do a great job." And <laughs> I want to shake both sides, so we see it quite a lot. Yeah, and you, Kurt, um, Serena, how many uh, f- female uh, chief constables are there? You're the first in, in Merseyside. Yeah, we're actually we're actually doing um, quite well um, as a gender and being chief constables at the moment. So uh, um, a couple of years ago, we went as low as five. Um, but now I think we're up. We're up at 18, 19. So there's 43, um, there's 43 home office forces. And then in the Met, you have a commissioner, deputy commissioner and two ACs, which can account as chief, which are the same you know, equivalent. So including them, I'm sure we're up to about 19, 20 now. So. You know, we're not far so taking on like, the 50-50. Yeah. yeah, and I think, you know, so the two worlds I work in, academia, I think, is like that, and medicine is, is, is certainly like that at the more junior levels and getting towards that as one goes up the ranks. But what about um, race is the other side, of course. Uh, you know, even a lot of organisations, even if they've managed to balance things up on the gender side, they're, they're behind a bit with race. How many... Uh, chief constables are there from uh, ethnic backgrounds um we've got one um yeah we're, we're definitely in terms of inclusion um we've got one equivalent so we've got a, an ac in the met um and we've had one female uh, black uh, chief constable previously uh, and a male black chief constable in kent so mm. you know um i have to say uh, inclusion is an absolute priority um, for for policing. Yeah. So whilst we're doing well on gender for chief constables, um, we are still behind for gender and for and for ethnic minority groups yeah. in terms of the numbers that are joining. It's the same in, and the progression. Yeah, and it's the same in our in the academic world, certainly academic medicine. Um, you know, there's more work to be done there, and of course we can pin it all on Curly because it's people like her not pulling in not you know who they're out there doing the headhunting and finding the potential candidates do you keep track on these things Kelly? is it is it something you monitor um tom you are absolutely right we did a two-year report i think for the cabinet office actually looking at best practice in diversity recruitment um, and by the way so, you know i love the fact you call it inclusion because that's what it is all about um and you know that really came out was that actually the search firms aren't doing the job well enough 
we oh, really? are not presenting enough diverse candidates. Sorry. I was to... teasing. <laughs> no, I know you are. <laughs> we aren't actually um, pressure of the number of jobs. Sometimes the time scales. If you want to map the market, you have to be given time to do it. If you do it in a rush, you can't reach. But if you do the job properly and map the market, you can always give a diverse shortlist. So I bang that drum with my competitors. And it's also about, I found particularly uh, with the, uh, so this is sort of, I don't know, 10 years ago, I guess, when we got into this on the, on the, uh, the gender side, that actually forcing yourself to look. So even just simple things like not, well, appointments, but even who we would have come in giving named lectures and some of the big plenary talks. If you, if you force yourself and you say, you know, you look back and you say, gosh, it's been 90% men. And you say, no, we're going to make sure it's 50-50 going forwards. And then that you do find just makes you stop and not go for the usual suspects and just think a bit more widely about what interesting people there are out there who potentially could be applicants for whatever the position is or give the lecture or whatever it is. And to some extent, it's just making yourself do that bit of extra work and having the time for it. And back to that, that bit of extra work, Tom, put, putting the effort and time, not just using a Rolodex, not reaching to what's easy, but forcing yourself to go that extra mile. And that's where you get the inclusion. And also not doing the obvious. You know, there's at the moment we're uh, getting people coming to us for board appointments and they are saying we will only accept a black shortlist. Um, and, you know, I, I sometimes push back and I say, but actually, if we're going for this shortlist, there are other characteristics, you know, very well educated black people. Actually, what about some very socioeconomically challenged candidates? So I do think we need to continue to debate and question this. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I wanted to just move on to something. Uh, young people. So basically, Curly, your hypothesis in your Cambridge code is, is if I, you know, in a, in a nutshell, I think that uh, or, or at least a lot of it is about people's upbringings and how they respond to situations early in life and what happens then influences how they, what they succeed in, et cetera, et cetera. And I know that Serena, for you, um, when you've been doing your work with communities, you feel quite strongly that you, you need, you know, putting effort in to help people early on, to help young people stop them from going down the wrong path is, is important. So let's just um, maybe Serena, you tell us a little bit about what you what you've your findings have been in that area and why you feel so strongly about that. And then we'll come to Curly for some reflections. I think that's the change we're seeing. I mentioned that police leadership is changing in terms of behaviours and skills, but I also think it's where we position ourselves as police leaders as well. Um, so yeah, a lot a lot of the, the system change that we need to do. Policing ends up picking the pieces up when something's gone wrong, um, invariably, where there's factors in people's lives, they end up coming into contact with policing, which is why I think policing needs to position itself within that whole partnership arena and in that kind of public service and public sector reform to make sure that we can identify those, um, those individuals, those young people, those families, those postcodes, where there are indicators that they may well ending, end up needing more support, whether it be from health, whether it be from education, whether it be from policing. And actually, we change how we engage with those, I say, those young people, those what individuals. What does that mean in, 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 in sort of practical, simplistic terms? You know, how do you change how you engage with them? So get so identify so what are the indicators? It's I suppose it's a bit uh, you know you talk about the Cambridge Code with an algorithm. What what does the evidence tell us? What would the algorithm tell us? Who are the individuals and the families that we would want to engage with sooner? And so that there's there's nothing there showing at the moment, but we don't wait until we start to see those things. We don't wait until we start seeing truancy or or you know minor signs of criminality or issues around vulnerability that end up, pe people end up, you know, getting involved in county lines, that we actually work okay. with those families, individuals sooner How, so that means as, a, as a partnership, not just from a police, you know, because policing can't do this alone we've got to be part of the solution so for me it's absolutely about how do we you know rather than wait till all different agencies are involved with young people or families or or, or areas we actually start the work sooner 
and 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 so that means not waiting you know not that their first encounter not being because they've committed some minor crime but what what is the early encounter then how you don't go you don't you don't go knocking on doors saying oh, we're the local police can we come in for a cup of tea just to say hello well, the work, interestingly, that's been done, that's being done by um, by health and care as a result of the white paper around the integrated care system. You know, they've overlaid. You know, in Liverpool and mm. in Merseyside, they've overlaid health data and social care data to identify that those individuals, those families, those those communities that, that would benefit from that more preventative approach. So rather than waiting for you know breakfast mm. clubs because we know attainment to school is better if you if children have breakfast that actually in certain communities everyone will have access to that you know to that breakfast club or smoking cessation or whatever it is and that you know the conversations we're having if you then overlaid policing data over that you're probably talking around the same people so what is it we can do from a preventative mm. you know to inco- to, to keep those young people you know, in school, engage, start having conversations around employment. We know in terms of the risk that young people excluded from school, the chances of them being exploited or becoming exploiters is far higher. So rather than waiting as we would have done in the past till we lock them up or we have to treat them as victims because they've been exploited, what can we actually do with local authorities, with schools, to engage and keep young people in school. I get it. So you're not saying that you, it's not necessarily direct, uh, the police directly engaging with them earlier in life, but you're saying if we put effort into keeping them in school, keeping them healthy, looking after them in, in, in those ways, that stops them heading down that route of, you know, missing school, petty crime, et cetera, et cetera. And then the benefits, you know, from a health perspective in terms of the demands that those people will end up needing acute responses from, you know, from the NHS. What is it in all of those that that we can do? Policing will needs to be part of the conversation. It won't necessarily be it won't necessarily be part of the solution in every case. Yeah. Curly, what what are your thoughts on all of that? The. It's the, there's the nature nurture debate. You know, you're naught to 18 years, um, and from where you are in the birth order to how you're treated by parents to the, you know, lots of factors there um, has a huge impact on. On, on your later life, the, the things like your drive. If you know, if, if you miss your adolescence for some reason, that, that's actually where your drive is created. You you create your drive in those stroppy teenager years, and and it's because you want to separate out. You know, you want to go create as opposed to, you know, you'll all remember. You know, young children would jump into bed with their parents, um, and then actually, as you become adolescents, you, you want to do the exact opposite, and um, and you want to break out yourself. If you're not allowed that adolescence, for example, you know, actually, you will miss that area of life that gives you your drive. So these years are really um, important, and in fact, a, a, a European study showed that in refugee camps, when we were looking at the sort of the um, the resilience and um, and and how affected some of the children were, actually compared to some very very well off and privately educated people in in, in a London therapy centre, they were much more resilient and had much more capacity to thrive in life because their home life was so secure. So even though they had had terrible difficulties uh, from hunger to where they were brought up, their family sense was so secure that they in themselves um, could stride on through life. So it's very interesting. Do you think the family sense is the most important of all the all the different factors is that the sense of belonging to family is a critical one? Yes, and how and how you're treated. You know, we all know that when you are, you know, if you if you break something, um, I think we talk about this in the book, you know, if, if if a child breaks something, they will say, That wasn't me. Even if they're looking at you while they break it, they just can't help it. They say it wasn't me who did that. Um, if they get shouted at, and that's normal, we, you know, we all mm. shout. Um, but if they get royally royally bollocks or told off or, or, or mm. you know, even hits, they will learn that behaviour that they learned age four or seven, that behaviour will be to hide a mistake. Mm. So they will, once they get into adulthood, they ingrained in them is to not show when they have done something wrong. And that in corporate life can lead to big mistakes. But the flip side is they usually great perfectionists. So 
there we go. There's always a flip side. Now, There's talk, always. Talking of flip sides, Holly uh, has been keeping an eye on things out there. What's been uh, what's been the discussion online, Holly? Yeah. So just a quick update from Sharon's teacher, who said, um, I mean, Kaylee's teacher, sorry, Sharon, said she was a very hardworking student with lots of character. So that was a nice um, reference from her. Character in inverted commas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so Colin on Zoom is asking, should political parties be using headhunters and psychological evaluation to pick their leaders and avoid mishaps? So that's probably for mm, Kaylee, yeah. I think. <laughs> Colin, I love that question. Um, in fact, we were once approached by a political party and we were asked, could we headhunt the candidates? I'm not going to say which party. Um, I'm very apolitical. Could we headhunt candidates to join them? Um, and I went along to a meeting. It was my early days as a headhunter. Um, and I walked into the one of the rooms and one of the old, you know, Tufty Bufty said, good God, there's a girl wearing trousers. And I thought, you know something? I'm probably not the headhunter you're looking for to, to help with this. Um, so they still do use those sort of networks, a little bit like MI5. Um, and we should absolutely be asked, we should be looking at what it is, you know, do they conceal things? Are politicians and our leaders actually, are they the type of people who would hide a mistake? You know, gosh, look at the squirming, you know, situations we have at the moment. Um, and the fact it isn't part and parcel is, is a shame. Okay, um, thanks. So the next question is for Serena, and this is from Anthony on Zoom, and he's asked, um, people living with disabilities can find themselves excluded from the police recruitment process. Is this likely to change anytime soon? Really glad you asked that question, Anthony. We are absolutely encouraging um, people with disabilities to apply, whether it be for police officer and police staff, and then working with the individuals to give them support for positive action through the recruitment process but then also what are the reasonable adjustments that you know that we can work together to enable you to to join the organization um, we we do a lot of uh, work around neurodiversity um, um, and have been quite successful in recruiting people into policing uh, who do identify as having challenges around neurodiversity uh, but we do it it's still um it's still an issue um, as, it, as it is with for people with other protected characteristics that we've discussed today. So gender, race, um, sexuality, uh, but there is positive action available uh, and would encourage people to, you know, speak to the recruitment team, to see how can we can actually work together. You know, I'm what, absolutely committed to try and make sure that we are more inclusive. What percentage do you, do you have in Merseyside? Do you know? Uh, no, I wouldn't. It, I mean, it's low. It's, it's, low. it's not. We're not even in double figures. Um, right. It is low. Like all organisations, I think, all big organisations. Yeah, Holly. Yeah. Uh, Curly, go ahead. Just very quickly on the disability, we um, and um, we did something with one of our amazing para um, Olympians and we had a four, you know, we had a whole bunch of recruiters in the room, actually, and, and human resource directors and people officers. And one of the things that came up was that people are still very scared about how to interact with people with disabilities, um, whether it's hidden or whether, and that's something that we need to be much more honest about um, and engaging, saying, you know, what can you tell us? We are nervous about getting it wrong with you. Help us to get it right. Yeah. And not just nervous about interacting, nervous about even talking about it for fear of using the wrong terms. Mm. Um, I think that's I think that's true of all uh, protected characteristics, yeah. and it's the conversation I'm having with the organisation. You know, is so we you know we have a percentage of the organisation who are willing to be allies, willing to be positive. Uh, you know, coach, mentor people uh, to either develop within the organisation or have those conversations with communities. But the majority of the people of people would say that they're, you know, they're not racist, they're not sexist, they're not homophobic, but actually uh, what they aren't doing is being proactive around those conversations. So saying, how does it feel when you are the only black officer to walk into a room and sit down on, in the parade room? You know, how does it feel to be a gay male in a firearms team? Um, and people are frightened to have those conversations, but actually for me, that starts to show that you care 
um, and demonstrate the right behavior so you can have those conversations and actually the individual feels more included because you've taken the time to just tap them on the shoulder now we need you know it's, it, it, we need to do more than just conversations but for me that would be a, that would be a real start yeah thank you um, there's just a couple of comments um, for Serena about what, what you were talking about earlier, really, um, about engaging with, with young people sooner. Um, so Katie on Zoom is saying that um, resources and support within communities should be available to everyone in that community um, in order to reach those who need it most to avoid the stigma of them, I guess, coming forward and, and accessing that resource. Um, and that links in with another comment that says, um, you know, there used to be youth clubs, church clubs, etc., which um, would probably help more. So I don't know whether you wanted to, to comment on that. Yeah, I probably I, I agree in some ways um, with Katie, um, but all, I, I agree in the comments around clubs and church clubs and that that access to, um, you know, kind of a broader community outside of school and keeping people engaged. You know, we, we, we work with uh, Everton in the community and the Liverpool Foundation uh, and the, there's academic evidence to support that that where you can engage young people and especially when you can engage them from year six as the transfer into year seven you've got much better chance in keeping that engagement then right throughout to school and then into into early adulthood the bit around um services being available to everyone that um, I do get that debate, but it's it's almost like the uh, debate on inclusion in that we treat we should treat everybody equally. Well, we're not all equal. Um, so actually, that's what the whole point around positive action. What is different about us and what the, what is the support that you need as an individual to get to the same position as everybody else? So I agree about the point of stigma. This is not about uh, stigmatizing people. But that we need to accept that everybody living in our communities are not the same. Um, they've not got access to the same to the same, um, you know, education, employment, services. And there does need to be that we treat somebody differently. We treat everybody as individuals and uniquely. Mm. Great, thanks. Now we're over. We are over time, so we better stop there. But. Um... I wanted to thank you both, Serena. Thanks for joining us. Good luck in your job over the next few years. Really interesting to hear your thoughts. And thank Curly, you very much. Curly, thanks for your fantastic insights and good luck with the Cambridge Code and the, uh, the, the headhunting. The Scouse Science Podcast will be back on February the 22nd. And we have our first repeat offender. Many of you will remember Jan Ravens, the comedian and impressionist, who made a great impression on us when she was on the podcast some months ago. And she's coming back on February the 22nd, which is World Encephalitis Day, to talk with us about her husband, who sadly had encephalitis. And um, as some of you will know, I'm the president of the Encephalitis Society. Encephalitis is inflammation and swelling of the brain often caused by an infection. And Jan's not talked to anyone about this at all before publicly. So um, it'll be really interesting to hear what she has to say and to learn a bit more about this condition. But for now, uh, I must just thank our guests, thank Holly, thank the team for supporting us. And we'll see you again uh, next time we have the podcast. So after three, I'd like everyone to say goodbye. One, two, three. Ooh, no. Bye. 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 Bye.